Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Online Surveying for Nonprofits and Best Practices. I just want to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. So all callers will be muted. If you have questions, you should see a chat box to the left-hand side of your screen. So as the webinar moves along, feel free to type in your questions, and we will um, try and answer them as we go along um, or during the Q&A at the end. If you lose your Internet connection, just refresh the browser, and there was a link that was emailed to you. Um, so just click on that again, and you should be able to log back in. If you want to watch the webinar again, or if you have to leave a little bit early, we'll be hosting the webinar on our website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. We'll also be sending an email once the presentation is over um, with the recording and any relevant links. Um, if you are on social media and you want to send us a tweet, you can use hashtag TSWebinars at TechSoup. Um, but like I said earlier, um, you know, the Q&A is what we're going to be focusing on in the chat box for this webinar. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. We are in 236 countries and territories, and we work with over a million nonprofits um, providing uh, either donated or discounted technology to help them run their organizations. Um, so I just want to give you guys a chance to um, you know, try out the chat box. So if you can send me a chat and let me know where you guys are dialing in from, that would be great, and I can read a few of them off. All right, so we have Arizona, Chicago, uh, Atlanta, Chesterton, Indiana, which is great because that's where our guest speaker is from today, from Indiana, um, Massachusetts, New York. Okay, so we have people calling in from all over the country. Do we have anybody international? I don't see anything yet, but hopefully uh, there is some international presence on the webinar today. All right, so um, some of our technology partners include Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec. Um, today one of our technology partners, Question Pro, is here to um, explain online surveying and how it works. I think you know, a lot of us know the technology that they've provided is very easy to use, um, but you know, it goes a little bit deeper in how do you ask the right questions, how do you collect the right data, um, so that all of that information is really valuable to you and to your organization. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. So we have uh, Vivek who's here from Question Pro. He is the founding member and executive chairman of Question Pro, and he plays a key role in defining the company strategy and uses technology and innovation to maintain its leadership in the industry. In 2008, Question Pro made Inc.'s magazine's list of fastest growing private companies, ranking 172nd overall and 25th amongst business service providers. Uh, we have Mitch from the Schaefer Leadership Academy, and he is the Executive Director. The Schaefer, Sh sorry, Schaefer Leadership Academy is an organization that provides the tools and resources uh, to help develop leaders for people of all ages, backgrounds, and interests, and they are located in central Indiana. And then myself, my name is Seema, and I am the online learning producer here at TechSoup. And I'm excited to host uh, both of our guests today. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Vivek. Awesome. Thank you, Seema. Thank you for having us. Hey, this is Vivek here from Question Pro. Um, and a uh, couple of quick kind of items. Uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you ask as many questions. I'd love to have webinars when things are interactive. And obviously, I can't hear you guys, but definitely keep, uh, keep asking the questions. And uh, we'll throw out this presentation as we go along. Our intent is to kind of stop and kind of see if we can answer a few questions as we go along um, for the next uh, 35 to 45 minutes that we're going to go through this. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, me, and uh, I'm super excited to be uh, you know to have Mitch also with me. Mitch is actually one of our one of our clients, um, and uh, and uh, I let uh, I'll just go through the agenda really quickly, and then we'll kind of introduce ourselves. Um, uh, the goal here today is to talk a little bit about online surveys and research. Uh, and we will go over a couple of different survey types, give you some examples. And, uh, and Mitch has some very uh, pretty amazing examples that he's used question pro um, internally uh, within the Shape of Leadership Academy. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about how he actually used question pro. Uh, it's not even about question pro, it's how he's used surveys, frankly. Um, so that's kind of the general agenda for for the day, for the for an hour, if you will. Uh, 
Hey, hey, hey Vivek, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yep. Um, we're getting a little, um, a couple of feedback saying that they're having a little trouble hearing you. If you don't mind getting closer to the mic or. Okay, I'm on a headset. Uh, okay, all right. Is okay, it better? You. Can you guys hear me better? Yeah, yeah if you guys want to chat, okay. chat in and let us know if that's okay. Yep, I think that's better. Okay, cool. So uh, just a little bit about Question Pro. So we are an online survey platform. Uh, I started it back in 2005. Uh, we have about 100 employees and are fairly global. We have offices here in San Francisco, in Chicago, um, and also in, uh, in India, Germany, and, uh, and Mexico. Uh, and uh, I've been in the business for quite a while, frankly. Uh, and, uh, and I've also done a couple of books around online surveys and online research. Uh, Mitch, I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Well, good afternoon for everyone who's um, in the Midwest or the Eastern side of the nation, and good morning to those of you who haven't had lunch yet. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Vivek. Uh, my name is Mitch Isaacs with Schaefer Leadership Academy, Executive Director. Uh, you're going to be learning a lot more about us a little bit later on, but as you can see, we are a very small not-for-profit located in Muncie, Indiana, which is about an hour northeast of uh, Indianapolis, and you may know of Muncie because you might know of Ball State University, which is David Letterman's uh, alma mater. He's, he's our, our proudest graduate. So that's what put Muncie on the map. You can see we're a small organization with a small staff, uh, but out there doing a lot of great work and, and look forward to telling you a little bit more later on about who we are and what we do. But uh, before that, I think Vivek's got a, a question for the group. Okay. All right. Uh, so the first question I have for everybody, I, I would, I'd love to have a question here. And have you guys ever run a survey for your organization? Um, you know, and, and I went to kind of, if you can just uh, force that answer right there, we will wait till we get about 100 or so results. And I think we got most of them. I'm going to just jam into results. So most of you have run surveys. So great. So a few of you haven't. Obviously, that's the ratio, as you can see, 75 to 25. So let's kind of jump right into it, right? So what is generally the purpose of doing online surveys, right? So there's a lot of ways to collect data, and you can measure uh, behavioral data very easily. A good way of, you know, there are two kinds of data if you want to kind of think about it. One is behavioral data, and one is what we call attitudinal data. So attitudinal data is what people think, and behavioral data is what people do. So uh, a good example to kind of start, kick start this conversation would be to say, like, let's say you invited, you know, 20 people to come to a webinar or come to your birthday, and eight said yes, and 12 said no. So you have behavior, which is eight people did something, and 12 people didn't do something. But you don't have a pretty good idea of why those eight people showed up or why those 12 people did not show up, right? So what a survey does in general is to kind of understand why people are doing something. So in general, you can go down the path of thinking. If you ever keep asking the question why, um, you can probably use a survey to determine the answer to that question. Uh, so that just goes for regular surveying. And, and surveys have been out for quite a while. This is not something new. Um, and so have, frankly, online surveys have also been out for quite a while. Uh, but online surveys, using online surveys within the nonprofit kind of ecosystem has been um, I wouldn't say it's new, but, uh, but I think there are many. What we want to do today is to kind of walk you guys through uh, a couple of use cases that we've used online surveys uh, to kind of create interesting data. Uh, the key elements, as you can see on the screen, you know, especially when it comes down to online, you collect the data real time. You know, we just did a survey. We figured out 75% of the people have done a survey. So this is information. This is information that you've gathered, we've gathered, so that then um, I know kind of my audience now. So I know my audience really clearly, like, you know, about almost 70%, 80% of the people have, you know, have been exposed to surveys. Uh, and so that, so I can tailor the content as I, as I talk to you guys, um, I can tailor the content to that. So the general idea behind running a survey is to collect data and then turn that data into content and action, as you can see over here. Uh, so use that data to actually kind of, you know, you know, inform your decision. So that's the key part that I would say. Um, one of the key takeaways that I have for you guys is like, you know, if you want to measure attitudes, surveys are a great way to measure attitudes. Um, surveys are probably not useful for measuring behavior, but surveys are great to, to measure attitudes. So now let's talk a little bit about what kinds, what, what are different types of surveys. Uh, 
Uh, and this is not, I would say this is not uh, specific to nonprofits, but one of the challenges that I think nonprofits have, you know, compared to kind of commercial, we are a commercial entity, obviously we're a tech company, we are a commercial entity, uh, you know, I have my board and my board, you know, has very clear metrics for me, right? So, you know, and they're all, you know, typically they're financial metrics. Uh, in many cases, there are other, other operational metrics for us, right? So, so we have a very clear, I think in the commercial world, it's very clear, you know, you know, it's, it, there are financial metrics you know, all the way from profit margins to uh, net revenue to everything else. There are clear metrics for us. Our, for mission-driven organizations, um, having obviously there are no financial metrics, uh, and it becomes really tough for mission development organizations to to showcase kind of outcomes and showcase results. Um, and so surveys, um, I've seen a lot of uh, you know mission driven organizations use surveys as a mechanism, as a proxy uh, to to determine uh, how they are doing. Uh, and these are the different some of the survey types. Um, I would say that uh, all our customers um, have used over the years. Uh, and just to give you guys some perspective. You know, uh, within Question Pro, we have about, you know, I think about 12,000 customers, um, you know, including, including nonprofits, commercial, and enterprise customers across the board. And we do about, you know, about five to six million surveys a week. Um, so between, between all our customers. So we've seen, you know, we've seen kind of pretty much every single kind of survey that people have done. Have, you know, as you can see, the, the, the scale is extremely large. Um, and so the types of surveys that you can do, you know, really is, is really not even dependent on the platform. It's really dependent upon, dependent, frankly, upon your imagination, if you will. Um, I have a quick, uh, I have a quick, uh, again, survey for you guys, a question for you guys, really. It's like, have you, I mean, uh, I know a, a lot of kind of nonprofits depend on volunteers and volunteer kind of, kind of volunteers coming and doing work for them. Uh, have you kind of have you used surveys to kind of measure their experience? Volunteers are coming in um, typically for an experience. Have you used surveys to do that? And I'm gonna skip to the results in a minute. I've got enough data. So as you can see, yeah. So we, we're getting a, a live feed. It's like you know, yes, people have run surveys, but they've not used it for measuring volunteer experience. And so that's one use case where you could use a survey to measure volunteer experience. That's just one particular way. Uh, and Mitchell is going to show a couple of different interesting ways in, in, in about you know, 10 or 15 minutes. But uh, I know we've seen that volunteer experience is kind of one of those things that uh, people come in for the experience, and you can measure that by just asking a few questions about how their experience was. And uh, what I want you to take away is so this can be a very effective mechanism for impact assessment. When I say impact, and impact showcasing is also important. Um, partly because nonprofits are clearly mission driven um, and in a mission driven environment. And the same thing applies to even government entities um, a lot of times. And that's why we do a lot of work for uh, a lot of government entities where, you know, uh, where we, they use the surveys. The legislature almost has kind of mandated different agencies that they must provide a level of customer satisfaction. And how do you determine a level of customer satisfaction? Well, you know, a simplest way to kind of determine that you are providing a service is by asking the customers, saying, are, are you happy with the service? Are you satisfied with the service? So we'll go through a couple of different ways, a couple of different kind of models for, uh, for asking questions also in a minute. Uh, so uh, now let's talk about the survey itself. Uh, so in research, there are broadly two different models for collecting data. Uh, one which is quantitative uh, that collects data and like we just you know you just saw the yes no question that we just asked it's a quantitative model uh, to collect data and then there's a qualitative model also uh, within a survey you can ask open ended questions like hey how do you feel about it uh, what are things that we've not asked you uh, that's an important element um, a lot of times in surveys you may not think about asking all the questions um, and and an easy way of uh, getting beyond that is by saying, hey, tell us something that we've not asked you. And uh, you can just look at those comments uh, and then make, a, make an informed decision. So broadly speaking, when you start designing a survey, you've got to think about, okay, what, are the, what is the information that I'm going to get, collect quantitatively? And what is the information that I'm going to collect qualitatively? And both of them can be done in the same survey, but you have to understand that there are two different models uh, typically in play. Uh, and when it comes down to it, 
you know, creating creating a survey uh, within Question Pro. We're not going to go into Question Pro. This is not a you know talk about how to use Question Pro, but generally a talk about surveys. So, you know, there are over 80 like you know like the site says there are over 80 you know question types that are available, all the way from uh, star rating questions to uh, to slider questions that uh, that you can use, and the system is obviously fairly intuitive. But you have to think about these kind of questions uh, in terms of asking the satisfaction question, asking questions like, "Hey, how satisfied are you?" or questions like, "Hey, would you recommend this nonprofit as a volunteer? Would you recommend uh, this particular nonprofit to your friends and you know friends and family and colleagues?" Uh, so these kind of questions that kind of elicit elicit response. Uh, beyond, you know, that is the thinking um, beyond in, of the users is what you want to think about and you want to design that survey. Uh, you can include logic within the survey. So you say, like, if you say yes, do not ask these questions. If you say no, then you know, obviously not. There's no point asking redundant questions. And one of the things that's, you know, one of the interesting things that, that we've seen um, over the years is that, you know, people love answering, you know, people give, uh, love giving kind of, you know, visual feedback. So things like star rating questions, as well as uh, as well as uh, kind of slider questions, are you know immensely popular amongst respondents. Uh, and response rates for these kind of questions are always higher than uh, simple rating boxes and check boxes. So, so that's something for you guys to think about. And the final thing I want to kind of for you guys to think about is customizing the themes, the logos, and the color. Um, it's important to you know, bring your brand into surveys because the surveys effectively represent your brand. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, within Question Pro, obviously, you can customize the theme, the logos, add logos, change the colors to the survey, um, and so you can do all of that. So, uh, so the, the question types and formats that are available are you know, fairly, uh, fairly large within Question Pro itself. And frankly, with most other, not, no, not only with Question Pro, but any, any, any survey platform has allowed, uh, it gives you the option of creating different kinds of questions. Um, and, and there are a whole bunch of libraries that are also available. Uh, predefined questions we call these survey templates or question library. Um, and you can use any one of those um, libraries also to design the survey. And one of the things, like I said earlier on, key takeaway is, uh, you know, when you design a survey, you know, most people go in with open, you know, very closed-ended questions. But uh, my recommendation, again, to, to all our clients, including nonprofits, is to always include an open-ended question in your survey. Uh, this kind of gives the, the, the respondent the ability to say something that you've not asked uh, instead of being, you know, so this doesn't give that feeling of being, being, being boxed in. Uh, and here's a quick example of kind of a survey um, as you can see, you know, most people have seen surveys like this. Um, this does not include the slider question, but, you know, the, the background, the foreground have been customized. There's a slider and the logos have been customized over here. Uh, like I said, like, you know, making the brand carry through in the survey uh, is hugely important uh, because this is, you know, again, it is, it's something that represents you and, uh, and it's, it's important that, that uh, you know, to be partly this increases response rates. That's the fundamental reason because people know that it's you who's you know, collecting the data. It's not, you know, it's not somebody else. Uh, Seema, I'm going to stop here really quickly for see if there are any questions that sure. have come up that we can, we can engage in. Yeah, so I think um, we look like we're pretty good right now. I don't see any questions coming in. I just want to remind everyone, um, you guys should see a Q&A box on the screen, and we have uh, you know, Vivek and Mitch um, available to answer your questions in addition to um, some representatives on the back end. So feel free to ask questions as we go along and we'll, we'll, we'll try and answer all of them. So I think we're good awesome. for now. Okay, great. So, so the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, surveys, you can measure surveys for, like I said, volunteer experience as well as, you know, how making, doing kind of impact analysis of, you know, if you're, if you're serving a particular area and then you know, really going back to that area and saying how before they feel about your service. Um, but that's, that's the typical model. Uh, and then what, what I want to talk a little bit about is some of the atypical ones, so, you know, some things that, uh, that people have used. And, you know, we are a technology platform. We don't tell people how to create surveys. Um, you know, we, we help create, you know, we help, we help with the technology itself. Uh, we are not, we're not a market research company. So, um, but we've seen a whole lot of surveys over the over, over the many years, um, and some of these, as you can see, um, you know, as you can see, the the variety, the, the the 
spectrum of things that you can do with surveys is extremely large. Um, you can, you know, measure employee satisfaction with surveys. You can measure customer satisfaction. You can, you can measure any program that you're running and saying, like, is this working or not working? Um, and simple, you know, you could start out with a simple yes, no question, or you could go a little bit more nuanced in terms of, like, hey, rate this on a one to five scale or rate this on a one to ten scale. And how do you, you know, how, how are we doing with respect to um, different, uh, different, uh, you know, different uh, services that you're providing? And uh, one of the stories I want to tell over here is, you know, we, we got contacted. This was this happened uh, about two or three months ago uh, by a nonprofit called the Startup Policy Lab um, out right here in San Francisco. Um, this was during the net neutrality debate um, when FCC kind of canceled the net neutrality kind of ruling, um, and they got like 20 million comments on their website, right? Uh, and the Startup Policy Lab uh, wanted to figure out hey, um, you know, the FCC has 23 million comments and there was a lot of kind of talk about, you know, most of them are fake bots um, and people were jamming the, you know, you know, effectively jamming the public commenting system uh, through bots and through, through kind of fake, I guess, uh, people just pushing it in. Uh, so they came to us and said that, you know, can we, you know, through the Freedom of Information request, they got all the folks that were actually, that actually had submitted comments and what we kind of devise with them is through those 23 million, we sampled a smaller subset of 600,000 users, and we sent out a survey to all of them saying that, hey, did you post this comment um, on the FCC website to, to make sure, that, to validate the fact that it was actually human beings that were posting comments versus bots that were posting comments on FCC's website. Uh, so this was a project that um, the Startup Policy Lab and us, we collaborated on it, and we, 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 we ran this project. If you think about it, in the traditional sense, it's not a survey, uh, but we use the survey platform as a mechanism to kind of validate some piece of data that was already given to something. Uh, not that you guys would do something like this, but it's, a, it's kind of like what I want to do is to kind of, kind of expand everybody's horizon into thinking about how can we use, you know, how can we use the tool, how can we use surveys. And, and the, the key thing that surveys provide is the ability to collect data. Ability to collect you know, open-ended data, closed-ended data, any kinds of data that you want, uh, that you can create, collect, and deploy, you know, fairly easily. And so these are the these are some of the models that um, that that we have kind of that we have used internally, and then we continue to use um, as as we go along. Uh, I got another kind of quick question for everybody in the group. Uh, uh, you know, for the, for the center of percent who have actually done surveys, uh, I'm assuming it's some sort of impact assessment or kind of, you know, execution. Uh, have you used that data uh, to present to your board itself? Um, so let us take a look at the results. Uh, so good. Uh, at least half of us have kind of presented to the board. Uh, if it is relevant, very likely. Uh, uh, we think, uh, you know, a lot of our customers um, use survey data to kind of show impact, and therefore, you know, and, and the board for most nonprofits is where, uh, you know, you know, impact uh, impact assessment is being made. So this is a good good example of, you know, when we collect data, you need to present the data somehow back to the relevant stakeholders. Um, and my key takeaway, take and the final one over here, is that. Hey, you know, with Question Pro and with TechSoup, um, you guys have access to Question Pro. You have an access, access to a fairly versatile tool that, um, that can do a lot um, in terms of both data collection, execution, as well as reporting. Um, and uh, we'd love to kind of have you guys use it in any way you can see. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to, uh, to, to Mitch. All right. Well, thanks, Vivek. Um, once again, hello, everyone. And my charge is to give uh, everyone here a few examples of how a not-for-profit is, is using a tool like Question Pro in uh, what we hope are some uh, predictable but also some innovative ways as well. And so a little bit more about Schaefer Leadership Academy before I explain how we use online surveys for our organization. I tell folks we help people learn how to lead. Uh, we don't teach leadership because I don't believe you can teach leadership. Our goal is to be facilitators. And so what that means is uh, having programs and experiences, and, and some of our programs are simple two-hour workshops all the way up to our signature program that we've been doing for 11 years, which is an eight-week, 30-hour uh, experience. 
So we have a lot of different things we do, but all of our programs all come back to one simple idea, and that is leadership happens between the ears and between the rib cage, which is my way of saying it's a head and heart thing. And uh, I can't tell you how to see the world differently. I have to help you uh, see the world with a new set of eyes and, and learn how to interact with people in a different way. And so we do that through facilitation, uh, through uh, small group conversations and intentional activities and discussions. And so you can see on the screen some of the topics that we do. Uh, one of our previous slides said that we did 113 programs for 3,000 people last year. That's not a 113 different programs. That's some stuff more than once, but we cover a lot of topics. Um, and one of the important things to remember about what we do is that it's really not probably too different than what you do. You know, in the not-for-profit world, measuring your mission, I think, can be a real challenge. And I tell folks all the time that the difference between a for-profit organization and a not-for-profit organization is that a for-profit organization measures their success in one very simple way. Profit, money, how much money do we make? Those of us in the not-for-profit world, we have a, uh, a more complicated task in front of us. Uh, we measure our success and mission, and, and hopefully we're, we're making a little bit of money along the way to pay the bills and, and to put some stuff away in the bank for a rainy day. But at the end of the day, our goal in the not-for-profit world is to live out our missions. And, and as you listen to me talk about Shaver Leadership Academy, I hope you can relate that leadership is really tough to measure. You know, it is, it is hard to quantify what leadership is, let alone measure if someone's become a better, better leader as a result of an experience with us. And I would suspect for some of the other not-for-profits on this webinar, you have a similar situation. But you can see on the screen in front of you what our mission is. And like any not-for-profit organization, it always comes back to the mission because that's why we exist. So let me tell you broadly um, how we use Online, online surveys and, and Question Pro to assist our organization. Um, really first it's measuring mission, which I'm going to tell you more about shortly, and then board development, which I think is probably, um, I don't want to say unique to us, but I think that it's uh, something that we do that, that maybe some other organizations on this webinar haven't had a chance to do. And so uh, in talking about measuring mission, Vivek touched, about, uh, touched on attitude versus behavior. Oops, excuse me. Sorry about that. I got a little bit of feedback there for a moment. Um, Vivek talked about attitude versus behavior. Um, and when we think about measuring leadership, it comes down to similar components. Uh, what we call satisfaction, which is another way of measuring attitude, pre and post tests, which is cognitive, and then assessing behavior. Hopefully with those three things together, we're able to capture a, a, a more complete picture of how we're living out our mission at Schaefer Leadership Academy. So measuring program satisfaction. What does that mean? Well, it, it's, it's pretty simple, really. It's just asking folks what did they think of, the, of our programs. As Vivek said, another way to consider that is attitude. And so um, this is probably not very surprising, but after we complete a workshop, and we, I think we had four or five different workshops just last week, we have a, an instrument that we send out to everybody who attended. And we ask the same questions. A lot of the programs we do year in, year out, um, and so we have found that it's helpful for all of our programs to ask the same base set of questions over and over again. And what that does is it gives us longitudinal data so we can see how our fusion leading multi-generational teams program, uh, how satisfied were people in 2018 versus 2017 versus 2016 versus 2015? Are we getting better at that program? If we're doing it often enough, hopefully we should be. And if uh, people are less satisfied one year, then the next, so what do we need to look at changing or adjusting? And so it's a, a way of making sure we're, miss, we're hitting the mark. And if we miss the mark, where is a course correction? Uh, this is also something that I've used often um, in post-grant reports or in grant proposals. Uh, you know, as we all know, funders love to ask about goals. And so to be able to say one of our goals is to hit um, a certain mark on satisfaction is, is an easy goal to measure. Uh, and it's an easy goal to benchmark one year after the next, and it's the kind of data I found that funders really like when you're able to say, you know, 92% of our participants are satisfied or very satisfied with programs. Uh, it's certainly a way to, 
show funders that people are responding to what you're doing. And it's also a way to help people understand that if they're going to participate with your organization, they're probably going to have a good experience doing it. But I would say the key is to ask those questions, the same questions year in and year out, so you can really start benchmarking your data. Uh, so the takeaway here is satisfaction data, it's not robust. You know, you're just asking for people's opinions. And opinions are important, and opinions matter. Um, and so I, I don't mean to minimize that. But it doesn't always give you a complete picture. But again, I do think that if you ask that opinion in the same way, in the same questions, time after time, it does provide you with some very helpful benchmarking data that can be used uh, when assessing the effectiveness of your programs and your offerings and your services, and also reporting out to funders, donors, and stakeholders who might be interested in those metrics. Okay, pre and post test get at the, the cognitive idea. Uh, one of the things about leadership is if, if you want to find out if people are better leaders, one way, and again, this is a multi-pronged approach, right? So satisfaction is the first way, this is the second way. Another way of getting at if people are better leaders is finding out if they know more things. And so you do that through pre and post tests. One of our favorite pre and post tests is called the Leadership Practices Inventory. It comes from the Leadership Challenge, which if you know anything about um, business books or, or you are interested in leadership at all, the Leadership Challenge has been around for almost 40 years, widely regarded as a, a really helpful model for leadership. And um, with that comes an assessment on five metrics, a model of the way, what kind of role model are you? Encourage the heart, um, as it sounds. How good do you do at encouraging others and um, connecting with them on an emotional level? Inspiring a shared vision, which is really not just your vision, uh, but inspiring a, a vision that's shared among uh, multiple people. Challenging the process, you know, uh, making sure that you're not satisfied with the status quo, and enabling others to act. And out of those five things, there's a number of, of questions under each, and and folks take the leadership practices inventory before one of our programs, and then they take it again after the program, and they're able to see and we're able to see, and everyone who's interested in the progress of our organization is able to see what kind of growth they had, at least in what they knew uh, before and after the program. Um, some way that you can tie pre and post to behavior. This has become one of our most important talking points in the last two years. So we talked about satisfaction. You know, what did people think of our programs and offerings? We just talked about pre and post. Did someone learn more um, before, after the program than before? So giving them the instrument before the program, giving them the instrument again after the program. And then the behavioral piece um, is another way that you can do a pre and post. And so what we've started doing is uh, Emergence is our signature leadership program. It's where we started 11 years ago. It's eight weeks. It's what people know us for. Uh, we've asked people when they've registered now how involved are they in the community. Our mission is to create leaders for East Central Indiana. So we want to know when you interact with us, how much are you already leading? What level are you leading at? And so what we've been able to do is, using a tool like Question Pro, is we reach out to our graduates one year, three years, and five years after they graduate, which is a model that a lot of alumni um, engagement offices use on college campuses. My background is in higher education. That's what my master's degree is in. So I've learned some of these tools from my time on a college campus. Um, so colleges will often reach out to their alumni one, three, and five years, um, and, and oftentimes even longer than that, to see where they're at. So that's what we do. Uh, one year after completing our signature program, and then three years, and again, then five years after completing that program, we're finding out how are they involved in the community? You know, have they taken a leadership role? Are they serving on a not-for-profit board? Have they been promoted? Um, have uh, they taken on a new job? You know, are they taking on more opportunities at work? These are measures of behavior. When we're trying to figure out what it means to lead, and there are lots of ways to lead, what we've said and what are the behaviors that leaders do. And then we ask that question after people complete the program. And you can see that some of the statistics we've been able to report, the biggest one is that 75% of our graduates have taken a leadership role in the community. Uh, you can see the, the number of folks who have volunteered for extra assignments at work or serve on a not-for-profit board. And that's huge for us. And I would guess that for many of you that could be huge too, because what I do as the executive director is now I have just – two to three major statistics that when I'm in front of funders or donors or people who want to learn more about us, I can say, you know what, 75% of our graduates take a leadership role in the community. That makes an immediate impression on people who are interested in our work, and it tells a story. 
in just a very little bit of time. And for the people who are data oriented, that that you are trying to um, seek their support or their engagement, um, it helps them understand very quickly that you're effective at what you do. And so, uh, measuring behavior and just trying to drill down to what are those two to three key talking points that if you could stand in front of a group of people and, and really give them two to three data points for impact, what, what, what might those be? Um, and you can see what those are for Schaefer Leadership Academy and, and as we've been using them. So again, pre and post tests are helpful for assess, assessing participant growth and also for tracking behavior. Uh, before I talk about board development, I uh, just want to pause real quick and see if there are any questions on the topics I just covered. Hey, Mitch. Yeah, so um, we do have some pretty good questions coming in. Um, let's see. I'm wondering if I should – I think they're, they're probably relevant to both you and Vivek, so I think I'm going to hold off until the uh, Q&A, which is coming right up, and then we can just tackle okay. them all at once. Okay, happy to. Well, let me uh, move forward with the second part of my presentation, which is explaining how we use um, Question Pro for board development. Uh, that's not a picture of my board. I wish we had a boardroom that's not, that was that nice. Uh, our boardroom is not that nice, but it does make for a nice picture. Um, you know, if you're like us, engaging your board can be a challenge. You know, our, our boards are, are volunteers. They, they commit to our organizations because they have a heart for our work and they care about what we do. But at the end of the day, this is not their full-time job. And so, you know, engaging your board in just a little bit of time can be really challenging. So um, I think that, I hope you will agree, we found a couple of ways that are quick and efficient that, that help us not only engage our board, but better assess our board for, for board recruitment and also for better board effectiveness. So let me tell you a little bit about those things. Uh, we have a board matrix, and you can, you can probably see on the screen a few of the things, but uh, we give this to our board before we start our board recruitment season, and we use it, think of it as an inventory to analyze our current board. So we ask questions, we ask demographic questions, you know, about race and gender and age. Uh, we ask background questions in terms of, our, you know, they have experience in fundraising, budgeting, human resources government. Um, we ask questions about their access to money. We ask questions about their connections to certain parts of the community. But what we've done is built a profile where if we had a perfect board member, what are all of the qualities that that perfect board member would assess? And then we send this tool out to the board online. It takes them about five minutes to complete. And they check the boxes of what qualities they actually do have. Because not every board member has everything. You might have a board member who has a lot of money to give, but not a, not a little bit of time or a board member who has plenty of time um, but not a whole lot of money, or a board member who's great with legal advice but couldn't market their way out of a paper bag. And so, you know, we all have different needs from our board members. And so this is creating a list of all of the things you could possibly need in a board member, giving it to each board member to complete online. And then the great thing about a tool like Question Pro is it aggregates all that data. And what we're left with, you can see in the pie chart, um, is where our areas of expertise are. Uh, for instance, or where our demographics are, or where our connections are. And once you know where your board is strong, it also helps you understand where the board is weak. You know, oh, look, we, you know, we, have, uh, we don't have very many people of color on the board, or we, we have a lot of men and not enough women, or we have a lot of folks from government but no folks with legal experience, or we have a, a lot of folks from this sector of the community but not that sector of the community. And so board members can do it quickly, anonymously, on five minutes, and once all that data is aggregated, then what our board recruitment team has is a really good understanding of where the gaps are. And we can build a profile of board members that we need. And so we can be strategic when we go out and, and look for board members because we know where our gaps are. Uh, the other thing we do quite simply is a board exit interview. And so when a board member is done with their term, and um, you know uh, we have three-year terms, probably like most of you, that could be re-up for a second term. But when somebody's done uh, being on the board, either because they term out or their circumstances change, they meet with the board vice president. Um, and before they meet with the board vice president, we give them this very simple survey um, where they evaluate their time as a board member, they evaluate their relationship with me and the board president um, and the other board members, and they provide also um, some written feedback about their experience with the board. And then they sit down with the board vice president and go over that. 
Why the board vice president? Well, because as you all know, if a board member is going to have problems, it's probably going to be with the chief executive or it's going to be with the board president. Rarely is it with the board vice president. So we find that it's helpful for the board vice president because they're, they're usually an easy person to talk to, and it also gives them um, information before they move into their term as president. Because in our organization, once you're board vice president, next year you're expected to be board president. So very simple. Folks can do it in just a couple of minutes. So key takeaway here is quick demographic surveys, um, simple evaluation. You know, again, time, time. Your board members are busy, so these things can be done very quickly, um, and it gives them an opportunity to do it online, and you get to see all of the data aggregated, and you can use that information uh, for better board effectiveness. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn this back over. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Seema, should we just go into Q&A right now? Yes. So we can go ahead and move into Q&A. So let's see. All right. Um, okay. Sorry. Give me one second to gather some of the questions. Um, okay. So we have a lot of good questions coming in. Um, so in terms of like the length of surveys, is there a best practice around like how many questions is too many questions? And you know, if you do choose to in incentivize people for a longer survey, I think the challenge with nonprofits is obviously you can't offer you know any sort of like monetary reward. So, do you guys have any advice around around that? I think Vivek, if you want to maybe take that question. Absolutely. Um, I think what we found is kind of you know, especially kind of governments, nonprofits. Uh, schools, universities, a lot of universities use us. Um, you know, the general perception is that you have to incentivize people. Um, we don't think that that's true, and actually the data proves that a lot of, a lot of people take surveys because they actually want to help. They want to give feedback. And, uh, you know, and it's not always true that, you know, you need to, you need to give somebody a $5 Amazon gift coupon to a gift card, rather, uh, to get feedback from somebody, especially if they have um, some level of vested interest or some level of even interest in you. Uh, so clearly, uh, you're not doing consumer research. You're, you're getting feedback. Uh, typically, rewards are given for consumer research purposes where, you know, uh, Procter & Gamble is trying to come up with a new kind of Gillette uh, kind of razor, and they want to try out some new ideas, and they can go out and get some research done. Um, that's when rewards are typically given. Uh, within the nonprofit ecosystem, I have rarely seen people giving rewards, and, and frankly, I don't think that that will really substantially change response rates. Uh, what does change response rates is the way you communicate and the way you ask for people's feedback. Uh, and there is a, there's a science to that uh, to make sure that you kind of say, like, here's why you're asking the data, here's what the, your, in your feedback, here's how your feedback is going to impact us. Uh, if you can explain that clearly to somebody, uh, your your propensity for uh, you know to getting them to respond and spend five minutes with you uh, to take the survey uh, is is exponentially higher. Uh, so that's what I would say. No, that's my opinion on rewards. You don't necessarily need to give rewards. And the the answer is like, look, we need some feedback, we need some input, and here's how your feedback will actually change our behavior. Um, and if you are aligned in that, then then please you know spend five minutes. Um, and that, and you'll get people to respond to it. Um, now, the second part of the question was, hey, you know, do you, you know, long surveys versus short surveys? Uh, clearly, you know, short of the survey, the easier it is. I mean, nobody, you know, obviously nobody has the time to go through a 30-minute survey. Uh, I have seen kind of organizations that get carried away in terms of designing the survey because it's actually fairly easy to design, you know, a 50-question survey or 30-question survey. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, like, the general rule would be, like, you know, within, within five minutes, somebody's got to complete a survey. Uh, and after that, you know, there's a huge kind of drop-off in terms of attention span. I would say even, you know, it's two to five minutes is where people have enough time to do this. Um, so that equates to about you know 30 seconds per question, or 20 you know 20 to 30 seconds per question. So five to 10 questions, if you can condense everything within five to 10 questions, um, that would be ideal. Uh, that's at least my opinion. Mitch. Oh, I would I would echo all of that. I think that's good advice. The one thing I would add that we have found is timeliness matters, and so obviously not every organization here does work the same type of work we do, but when we do a workshop, we try to have a survey out within 24 hours. Um, we find that if it takes us much longer after that, 
your response rate falls off a cliff. So we try to get people while they're still thinking about the experience they had with us. And having a short survey, I think that your points really help. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Mitch. I mean, I think in the commercial side, if you think about it, uh, you know, the, it's called the moment of truth. Is like, you know, right when somebody buys something, Amazon sends me a survey literally within, within you, know, you know, 20 minutes of me receiving the package. Uh, so it's it's really important because obviously we all live very busy lives. We don't we don't remember uh, a lot of it, and there is kind of recency bias. Uh, so therefore, uh, again, uh, you know, Mitch had a great point around like, making sure the survey goes out uh, as close as you can to the the point of interaction. Great, that's super uh, helpful. Um, any other questions? Yeah, uh, we have a lot of really good questions coming in. Um, so I think another question, I guess, in terms of like anonymity and you know, giving people sort of uh, some ease around offering this information um, and making sure that it's private. Are there any, you know, best practices or anything that you specific, specifically co communicate to, you know, the people that you're sending it to so that they know it's, you know, anonymized? Well, for us, with the kind of work we do, um, somebody goes through a one-day seminar, uh, we let them know in the follow-up, we, well, we tell them at the end of the seminar, but then we also let them know in the follow-up email, we're going to send you a survey and it's going to be anonymous. Uh, and I think when you're asking people to tell you their experience with an organization, it helps people be a little bit more candid when they know that's the case. So it, it's as simple as just telling people and, and hoping that they trust you enough uh, to know that you're telling them the truth. But I would also say, though, for some of the things we do, it's not anonymous. You know, if you're going to do a pre and post, uh, you don't want it to be anonymous because you need to know how you're impacting people. If you're going to measure their behavior, uh, when, when we follow up with our grads one, three, and five years after completing the program, uh, we have an online survey, but then we also have interns who just call them and are putting in the information in the online survey. And in those cases, um, you know, uh, anonymity don't help us. So in the cases where it's, where, it's, where it doesn't matter where it's anonymous, we make that very, very clear. But sometimes uh, we need to know who the people are, and we just tell them up front. And to Vivek's point earlier, we tell them why it's important to know who they are and then, and then move forward as needed. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that. And I mean, I think the only thing I'd, I'd like to add over here is that, you know, this has come up obviously many, many times over the years uh, and to a point where uh, we actually even have built a tool where, uh, where we call it Respondent Anonymity Assurance, where we as a tech provider will kind of guarantee that this survey is anonymous. So even when, you know, um, and this is not for nonprofits, but for universities, this has been a bigger issue where when universities are surveying their, their own students for research purposes, uh, mm -hmm. for IRBs, they're typically institutional research boards require that the platform provider get somebody guarantee anonymity. Um, so that, that can also be done, and it's a flag that you can enable on the on question pro, so therefore you know, IP addresses, email addresses are all masked out, uh, so nobody has any information. Uh, at least pers personally identifying information is not, not available. Even though it's collected, it's not available, um, and, and you can go down that route also. But again, uh, the answer really is contextual, frankly. I mean, in some cases, anonymity is valued, and in many cases, you know, anonymity is irrelevant. Great. Super helpful. Um, so I guess in terms of like, um, you know, response rates, is there like a healthy number in the survey world? So if you send out 100 responses and, you know, 30 people respond, is that considered good or bad? Or is there, I don't know, a general number that people should kind of keep an eye on? Uh, well, again, it's, it's extremely good. Go ahead, Mitch. No, go ahead, because you, uh, I know what works for us, but you see this more globally, Vivek, so I, I imagine what you have to say is probably, uh, you have a broader perspective on this, so please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very contextual. Uh, it's extremely contextual. I mean, we've had surveys with response rates of 80%, where employee surveys are typically extremely high response rates on this, right? So, you know, you, you know CEO sends out an email to 40 of his employees, pretty much everybody's going to take it. Uh, you know, whereas when you send out a survey to kind of customers, uh, you get response rates. If you get response rates of north of 10%, you're super happy because, you know, look, you know, no customers are not in the business of taking surveys for you. Um, so really, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, the, my answer to this is typically is, you know, the response rate is a direct reflection of the strength of your relationship with, uh, with that person. So, 
you know, in the in the case of, in the case, in the case of board exit interviews, for example, you know, I imagine the board exit interviews are fairly high response rates because, like, look, they're not that you know, you work closely with the board member and they're leaving and you are sending them a survey and they're going to take it very likely. Um, you know, you know, eight out of ten guys are going to take it. Um, whereas if you are kind of, you know, if you are kind of, you know, if your relationship with that person is weak, um, then the odds of them taking it are lower. Simple. Uh, so the range, I, you know, you, you know, again, hate to be a consultant and say like it depends, but I mean, general customer surveys <laughs> for us are, uh, you know, in the in, in the five to fifteen percent for customer oriented stuff um, is, you know, I would say pretty good. Uh, for employee oriented, where you have a much stronger relationship, uh, constitute an employer employee relationship to be a, a fairly kind of strong relationship, uh, that usually is in the you know, 70, 60, 70% range. Um, at least that's what we've seen. Mitch? Well, I mean, I, I think that you're exactly right. It is contextual. I, I chuckled a little bit when the question came in because I, it took me back to my grad school days. Because <laughs> this is certain, certainly something we talked about in my master's program, and um, I think everything Vivek said is spot on. As a rule of thumb, I was taught rule of thumb, not a, not a, not by any means a, a, a fixture, just kind of a guideline. Um, Twenty percent response rate is pretty good, depending on your sample size. So um, I was always taught if you can get between twenty, uh, get it around the twenty percent mark, then um, it, it's probably a reliable measurement, you know, the, the statistics I quoted about the 75% who have gotten involved uh, of our graduates, I think that was probably about a 40 to 45% response rate, but that was with interns calling people a lot to get them to respond. But in, in basic stuff, in, in grad school, what I always heard thrown around was about 20%. Perfect. That's, that's good to know. I think it's nice for people to have kind of a number to, to focus on. So. Um, so another question that we got was in terms of, you know, paper surveys versus online. Um, you know, I think, for example, you brought up volunteers earlier in the um, presentation. You know, so if there's some sort of, like, volunteer event and, you know, people are leaving and you hand them a survey, like, do you find that most, pretty much all of your surveys are done online or is paper surveys still kind of a thing? Uh, almost all of our surveys are done online with the exception of I do have for, our, for one of our workshops an old school person who really likes paper <laughs> and so we, because that facilitator likes paper, um, we hand out paper and um, the response rate of course is significantly higher when you do paper. My only concern about paper over online, I mean, you're going to get a better response rate but you know, working in leadership, one of the things we talk about is, is people having different learning, thinking, learning, and working styles. And for those people who need some time to think about an experience, um, I don't know that paper is always the best format because there are people out there who, who need, you know, sometimes they need a couple hours or maybe a day to process whatever it is that just happened. And when you hand them a piece of paper and say, fill this out, um, you may not be giving as complete of responses because for those folks who are who are what my wife keeps reminding me she's a processor right I'm not I know how I feel immediately <laughs> but in my marriage we've learned that we think differently um, and so you know for the processors <laughs> sometimes they need time and so paper uh, you know paper has its its uses for for high response rate but uh, it's not my recommended way of doing surveys. Um, okay. Yeah. So so question. Uh, so one of our missions is is to eliminate paper surveys clearly uh, we are a tech company and uh, that that is completely kind of ethical to what we believe in uh, we do have a solution uh, where a lot of uh, in fact that's one of our you know uh, one of the products that we that we sell and it's actually included as part of the tech shop offering is uh, an offline app uh, that people usually download on an iPad, um, and it, I think the question was surrounding an event. Um, you know, we commercially we do that at uh, uh, in uh, conferences um, as well as, in fact, a lot of actually nonprofits have also used us in, in collecting data in, in international kind of areas. You know, going to Africa, collecting data. Um, the mechanism is you download an app. It's a Question Pro offline app. Uh, you set your survey up online, the same survey that you know Mitch sets up exactly the same way. Uh, but the, the data gets, the, the structure of the survey gets downloaded to an app, 
and then you don't need to be connected. Um, and then you can go wherever you want, collect data on the app, on the iPad. Um, and then hmm. once you are back on Wi-Fi range, uh, you can synchronize the data back to the cloud. Um, and that works, uh, that works, you know, I think uh, in, uh, in, in developing countries, we've used that very, very effectively as a mechanism, a more of a census mechanism, frankly, not even kind of attitudes, but more census data. Uh, healthcare, you know, health services providers have used that mechanism to collect data around kind of impact assessment of um, different uh, programs that they're running in remote parts, um, uh, in remote parts of the world. Uh, where obviously clearly there's no cell phone connection, there's no internet. Um, so that's another mechanism. Instead of using paper and pen, uh, you can pass an iPad around and uh, do that. But obviously that you know you still need to buy an iPad and make that happen. Um, so that's another mechanism you can do it. That's great. Yeah. No, I think that that probably helps um, with the privacy as well. So that's really helpful. Um, so another question that we got. Uh, so do you have tips on creating a brief survey that captures stakeholder feedback on how our programs are viewed and how they may value our programs slash organization? So I think Mitch, that might be a good question for Mitch. Uh, what, are your, what are your key performance indicators? What are your metrics? Um, you know, so it, it all comes back to your mission, right? So if you think about your mission statement, what are three to five questions you could ask uh, that capture that. You know. So I explained what our mission was. Um, and so I would encourage you to think about your mission, because that's always our true north in the not-for-profit world. And then what are you know, a couple of questions um, that reflect that, 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 that help you truly understand the, the, the job you're doing at meeting that mission. And, and, and you'll know that not only from the work you do, but the opportunity to ask these stakeholders their perceptions. And so I think if you bring it back to your mission and questions that reflect your mission, um, you're not going to go wrong. Great. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and again, this is probably a little broad, but um, in terms of like best practices, you know, and you, you kind of went over this earlier in the presentation, but. Um, in terms of analyzing the data, once you have it, you know, like, I guess, do you have any best practices around that? Uh, yeah, I can, I can, yeah, I can. Yeah, go ahead, David. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll go brief and then you can jump. I mean, I think the, the, general, the general model is that you're going to have high-level data, overall aggregated data, right, which is produced by default. So the, here's, what, here's what, uh, what everybody thinks. Uh, and really, depending upon the, the volume of data you get, then you, the next level is to start segmenting the data and say, like, look, like, you know, do males think differently than females? Or do people with, you know, five years of board experience think differently than, you know, 20 years of board experience? Uh, and to, to glean some insights from them. So that's a typical process mm -hmm. of kind of understanding, uh, understanding data. You start from the top and you say, like, this is what everybody thinks. Let's say we did the survey, like 75% you know, have done a survey. Now, we didn't go a follow-up question would be what kind of surveys have you done uh, as a board development of this and, and go down that process. So, uh, so my, my analysis here is that, you know, the best way to do it is start from the top and say, like, hey, look, this, this is the aggregate data and then start looking at segments um, and then go down that path. Mitch? I think that is, that is spot on. The only thing I would add, and Vivek, you kind of touched on this earlier, is the importance of qualitative feedback. And so almost all of our surveys are both quantitative and qualitative. So we're asking those rating, ranking questions. But then we're also asking open-ended questions that complement that. And I found that it is, that's helpful as well. So when you see a data point that maybe leaves you scratching your head a little bit when all you are seeing are the, part, the pie charts and numbers, you can usually then go back to um, uh, the open-ended responses. And so one of the things I like about tools like Question Pro is if you hear, you see some dissatisfied for something you're doing, you can click on that. And you don't know who the people are, but you can see the dissatisfied responses, and then you can go through and, and look at all the rankings, and you can look at the, um, also the open-ended qualitative feedback, and usually you're able to come to a more complete understanding of what happened. Perfect. All right. So. Uh, I think we heard some bells in the background, which is our cue to uh, wrap up the webinar. So I just wanted to go over um, a couple last things. Thank you so much, Vivek, and 
uh, Mitch for presenting today. Um, I think you guys probably saw Lashika's chat, but we have uh, a program with the Question Pro. So if you go to uh, techsoup.org slash question pro, you can get more information um, if you are interested in surveying your, your audience. Um, and you can also go to our, our product catalog for more general information on what we offer. Um, so just one thing that we like to do is we like to ask you to chat one thing that you learned in today's webinar. Um, and in the spirit of surveys, we also have a survey. Um, and we would love your feedback because it really helps us kind of dictate uh, future content and we want to know what you want to learn and what you learned today. And um, you know, any feedback you can give us is always really helpful. Uh, we're on social media, so if you guys are on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, we love social media love, and we post a lot of tips and tricks and things like that on there as well. Um, and then we have a blog, which we also post a lot of articles and how-tos, so um, you know, check our blog for more information. Um, and we have a few upcoming webinars, so you can see the schedule here. I won't go through each one, but um, we'll be sending out the slides, and this is also hosted on our website if you're interested in joining us for a future webinar. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Vivek, Mitch, uh, Lashika, John, and Esther who were on the back end answering questions. And thank you all for participating.